So then, today I'd like to say a few words about the late Joey Jordison. So the news is that about a week or so ago, Joey Jordison died. And I'd like to share my thoughts, I'd like to share my feelings, and I'd like to make the case that Joey was actually the best drummer in the world. Now, of course, there's a lot of ways to slice music. There's a lot of ways to analyze and go about looking at, well, what makes a good drummer? What makes a good composer? And there are drummers that can play faster than Joey. There are drummers doing things that are more rhythmically complex. There are drummers that are doing a variety of things that could, in certain ways of analysis, be deemed as, well, better. But the thing that sets Joey apart and the thing that makes him really the number one drummer in the world is two things that I can think of. One is detail. The man had a subtlety in his sound, a kind of detail in the actual timbre of what he was playing that went beyond any other metal drummer that I've ever heard. Now, of course, you could argue this as a variable unto itself and say, well, jazz drummers have a wider range of subtlety to them. And you can say, well, yes, in, as a matter of fact, by that variable, there are drummers that have more subtlety than, ha than Joey did. But when we're talking about metal and we're talking about a variety of variables, Joey really hits the mark on a number of occasions. And then the second thing is taste, right? Joey had a taste. And that's something you can't analyze. That's something you can't exactly put into words. And the way I understand taste, the way I really envision, envision the, the taste that Joey had was, it's like this. You can play, you can play a thrash beat and it, it's the same all the way through. Or you can play a broken beat and it's different every time, right? It's sort of very intricate. Taste is that balance between the two. Listen to a song like The Blister Exists. That is a perfect example of taste through thrash and broken beats. It's also a really good example of the subtlety in the sounds that Joey had. Now, a lot of songs really illustrate the sensitivity that Joey had, and this also goes along with the interaction that he had with the percussion in Slipknot. If you look at a song like Tattered and Torn, or The Virus of Life, or Circle, the beats in those songs are, in every way, quite simple. They are very non-technical in a lot of ways, particularly in a song like Circle. But the timbre, the attention to detail, is without question as deep as it gets. And that's what sets Joey apart. There's also something beyond Joey. There's something beyond just his musicianship as a drummer. And that is his musicianship as a composer. And this goes right back to even before the self-titled album. If you look at Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat, then you see that on songs like Some Feel, there's a very much awareness, like there's a very much a deep awareness of how the drums tie in with the guitar parts and the orchestration of the vocals and the orchestration of the other details. It's very much well thought out and well rounded 
as well as being very technical and very unique. Of course, of course, Joey wasn't a lone genius. He wasn't the only one that was able to sort of bring this amazing music to life, right? He was surrounded by bandmates that in that early Slipknot period came together to create something that was larger than the collective sum, right? That's what was so amazing about that early Slipknot. They'd found a cohesion between all the members that had given rise to this, this magic beyond it. And also there were producers involved. Like some would say that Rick Rubin <laughs> has quite a lot of a heavy influence, right? Over the people that he works with. And if you look at Rick Rubin's track record, it's like, it's almost like the best albums from every band that he worked with are the ones that he produced, right? So Rick Rubin produced volume three. And that, in my opinion, is one of the best albums that Slipknot ever did. And I will talk more in a moment about how I felt about that and how I came across that. But to just really hit home this point of Joey being the best drummer and one of the best metal composers in the world, there's another thing to consider. And that is when we talk about metal, when we talk about music, you can say, well, what is the heaviest band? What is heavy, right? How do you define heavy? And I look at that in two sort of general ways. One is catharsis. And catharsis is that feeling in the core, right? It's that feeling in, in the heart and the gut, right? It's the, the clenching of fists, the, the frowning of the face. It's the real sort of like, urgh, it's that emotional hit. And of course, <laughs> right, Corey Taylor is the, the absolute epitome of catharsis, right? That sort of personality, that sort of red meme emotional release, he just carries it like no one else. So you can't put that just down to Joey's playing and his composing. It's also a matter of Corey Taylor and what he was on about. Then another sort of side of heavy is like, what makes you pulse, right? When a song has pulse, the beat, what makes you want to move? What brings you to that mosh pit, that sort of jumping up and down? And that stroke, that sort of hit, that sort of pulse is driven by the drummer. And Joey could do it as good as anyone. Joey understood that as good as anyone. Now, there is another test, right, to say, is Joey the best drummer in the world? And that is to say, well, can someone else do what he did? And this test got faced, right? This test actually happened because Joey left under, well, the controversial conditions that he did. And Jay Weinberg came in to be a, the drummer in Slipknot, right? Now, this is interesting. Jay played the old songs. He played them. He can play them. He's perfectly technically capable of actually playing through those songs and nailing it note for note, right? The note, like when there's a snare drum, there's a snare drum. When there's a 16th note, there's a 16th note. When there's a crash, there's a crash, right? It's tit for tat between Joey and Jay. And yet that thing, that difference comes through because it just doesn't work. I'm sorry, but the sound, the taste, the, the thing that's just beyond the note, it's, the, it's, it's almost like the soul, right? It's just not there with Jay. Now, here's when we have to go beyond sort of the technical analysis of music and the way I do that, the way I look at that is that it's personality, right? When we get beyond the nuts and bolts of music and we look at the soul of music, then we're talking about personality. And then it's just a matter of opinion, right? Then it's just a matter of who you like, who you don't like. And of course, Jay is never going to live up to the old songs that Joey 
had given birth to in that early slipknot. It was never going to happen. No one was ever going to do that. And of course, you could say, well, Jay has been a part of the new period of Slipknot and he's written his new songs. He's part of the new songs and then he's worked with the band in that way and they've given birth to something different, right? It's just different. And that's fair enough. Another way of looking at this is that when a band these days makes a song, about a week or so later, there's going to be some child prodigy musician that can actually play that song note for note, right? And so that just completely levels the technical side of it, right? And that actually brings us back to what we were talking about with composing, with creating the song, actually making the song. There's something that is so underrated about creativity, giving birth to something that no one has ever heard before, no one has ever felt before, no one has ever experienced before. And having that thing open something up, open up a new feeling, open up a new way of seeing the world, open up a new expression. And that's where Joey had abundance. That's where Joey really kicked ass more than anyone. Now, of course, being in a band (laughs) has more to it than just soul, personality, and kicking ass. There's also the business side, right, of just turning up and being reliable and being on time. Now, we don't need to get into this sort of controversy. I don't really want to wade into the waters of this thing of, you know, why was Joey fired or any of that sort of controversy, right? That's for the lawyers to figure out. That's for them to figure out. All we can say is that we had this slipknot. We had this slipknot. We had this band and then it changed. And the comparison is light and day for me. It is just so obvious that that early slipknot was something just just incredible. And it was because of Joey right? He was a seminal component of that band, a seminal personality. So to sort of move beyond that and say, well, okay, Joey's the greatest drummer, greatest metal drummer of all time, the greatest metal composer of all time. We could say, well, what what kind of person was Joey off the bandstand, beyond the world of music? And of course, us common peasants, right, us common folk can only look on and wonder, right, at that celebrity lifestyle, that rock star lifestyle. We can only imagine, we can only dream. And of course, on the surface, right, it seems like this glorified life. It seems like, wow, just constantly touring, seeing the world, having having thousands of people just admiring you, right? The money, the fame, the success, the just, just nonstop glorification. It seems like a good thing, right? It seems like a profound, powerful thing, like who wouldn't want that life? What a colourful life. What an extraordinary life. But here's the thing. The glorified life is not the same as living in glory. Actually embodying glory is a different thing. Now, of course, I'm sure Joey experienced extraordinary feelings of glory. Extraordinary feelings of empowerment with his aggression and his success and his pronunciation and his assertion of his personality on the world. There's no doubt about that. But the deeper question is, did he know the deeper meaning of the word glory? Did he understand gratitude? Did he understand love? Did he experience true human connection? Did he have an awareness of his soul? Did he have insight into the nature of his consciousness, 
into the nature of his mind, into the nature of his soul, if I can put it in such words. And by many appearances, by many things that we've seen from Joey in the public eye, we can say that, well, we get this impression that he was quite a bitter person, he was quite nihilistic and pessimistic. And of course, there was hurt, right, to be kicked out of a band, to be cut off from friends and family like that, from something that was just, just central to his life, absolutely central to his identity, something that he'd given birth to, something that he'd poured so much energy into, right? That's got to hurt. That's really got to hurt bad. And I can see how, well, that would leave such a, such a pessimistic sort of taste in the mouth, sort of dark sort of view on the world. And of course, for these sort of situations, right, for these sort of circumstances, we, are, we just need compassion. We just need to come back to understanding, to, to the outpouring of love, to really the hope, the hope for someone else, the hope that they can have, that they did have the best life they could have. And that really brings us to check with, well, Joey's death. That really makes us sort of stand up and assess these things. It brings up these questions of, do you really want the best for someone else? Irregardless of the circumstances of your relationship, to really hope for the best of someone else, truly, authentically, at its core, is to set aside petty differences. It's to set aside mistrust, betrayal. It's to confront the hurt that is really there and to work through it, move through it, and to go beyond it. Because you must realize that you might not get the chance. It's perfectly possible. It is perfectly possible to die without making peace with the people in your life, with the things that you've done, with your situation. Most importantly, how you feel about your existential nature. It's perfectly possible to die without making peace with the fact that you exist. And these moments that we have, these reminders that come along with the death of someone like Joey, are a rare opportunity, an important opportunity to realize these things, to discover these things again, to remember these things again, because really we do know these things. On some level, we know these things. We do, right? We all know we're going to die. We all know it's important to love. We all know it's important to know thyselves, right? Self-knowledge, self-awareness, meditation, the good life, eating healthy, right? This is all stock standard stuff. It's no mystery. It's no secret. But how do we really know it? How alive to these truths are we, really? And that's how the death of a celebrity can wake us up. It can shock us into remembering these things that we should know, that we should live up to. And it was a shock for me to hear of Joey's death, death because, you know, I mean, I'd listened to that since I was 14 years old. I, I admired that guy so much, right? And I've listened to so many metal bands. I've listened to so many drummers, not just in metal, but in jazz, fusion, funk, soul, pop, all of it. I've heard it all. I've heard so much music. So don't think that when I say he's the best drummer in the world, it's coming out of ignorance, right? It's also not just a matter of how well I can argue the point to you, right? Really, the argument of 
Joey being the best drummer in the world is, is, is as simple as, well, he just is. Argument over. It's, it's, not a, it's not an argument, right? He just is the best drummer in the world. So really it is quite shocking to hear this news. And I have here my very first copy of volume three. You can see there's, you know, a piece of plastic broken off and it's all, it's all scratched up. It's like scratches all over it. And I remember I bought this in secrecy because <laughs> I came from a Christian background and I knew my parents wouldn't let me listen to the satanic band Slipknot, <laughs> right? Crazy to think of right now. So I like went to the CD store and bought it and I had to stick it down my pants, get it home in the car without mum and dad noticing. And I listened to it and I was just like, oh my God. And I remember, I remember opening up the front page of the liner notes and seeing, seeing the, the photo of the masks and just being like, oh man, what is going on with these guys? And then like hearing it, like hearing that first track, right? And, and the sound, right? Listen, listen to 3.0, listen to Prelude 3.0, the subtlety in those symbols. Right? He's got the bell sound, the ride sound, the splash, and the accents between those three. Right? That's the subtlety of the drumming. That's the subtlety. And then the flam fill, right? I can hear it now. Brack, boom, 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 brack, boom, boom, right? That that sound. No one can beat that sound. No one can emulate that sound. So Volume three really was just the most incredible album to me. And probably my favorite album is 9.0 Live. So I've got that there on CD because that was the, the first three albums, right? That first era of Slipknot. And it was live, right? So it's raw. It's got that real punch to it. It's got the catharsis to it. It's got the human side to it. And it's all the best tracks, right? It's all the best numbers that they do so those are my two favorite albums and i mean after that well slipknot took a different direction didn't it i mean it, of course everyone's got to change everyone's got to evolve in many ways i changed too right i'm a different person since then so it's no wonder that we feel differently <laughs> right it shouldn't be a surprise that we feel differently about how we are when we have different times in life. So, yeah, I mean, what, what a band, what a guy, what a, what a life. So, I wanted to say these words, I wanted to share these thoughts because it is a rare opportunity. It is an important opportunity to check ourselves with how we are and where we're at in life. Because we're only here for a minute. We're only going to be here for the blimp of an eye in many ways. And of course, the trick is how do we live like that? How do we realize that truth, right? Words are just words. Words are cheap. So that's my two cents. So thanks for listening. And if you can send this, if you follow any of the Slipknot guys on social media, please send this to them because I'd love for them to, you know, hear this, to sort of hear the connection, to hear some more of what's been happening. And of course, you know, I mean, those guys are, probably inundated with so much stuff that it's it's highly unlikely that they will hear any of this. But if you can, please share this with them because I'd love to connect with them. And, you know, leave your comment, leave your two cents, how Joey has affected you, and how his music has affected you, how his passing has affected you. And really just like, what is that thing that we celebrate? What is that thing that we can 
uphold as the true glory that Joey had that has inspired the glory within us. Because he really was, you know, the best drummer in the world. So, rest in peace, Joey Jordison, number one.